Hello everyone, welcome to our Facebook Live presentation from the Roman Baths this afternoon. Um, the, uh, we're talking about the Archway project and the latest developments in that, uh, which uh, at this stage now include archaeological works that are starting on site. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Archway project is uh, a massive redevelopment project in which we're creating a new learning centre for the Roman Baths and a World Heritage Site for the city. But uh, all this work starts off underground, <laughs> and uh, that's where we are today. We're beneath the road in York Street, uh, which is a street just along the south side of the Roman Baths. And uh, with me I've got uh, uh, several archaeologists who are going to talk us through some of the things that have uh, been discovered and are being prepared uh, in advance of the main works that are due to start later this year. So, uh, my name's Stephen Clues. I'm just going to pass on to Simon Cox, who's the uh, project manager for Cotswold Archaeology, and uh, he's going to tell us what they're planning to do over the next uh, four, four or five weeks. Okay, thanks Stephen. Um, well, as you can see, we've got the, the space under York Street here. Um, we've got a team of archaeologists working down here. Basically, at the moment, we are just cleaning everything up. So this area has been exposed since the dug it up, and we're coming down to basically clean off all the modern trample and all the dirt that's accumulated over it and to see basically exactly what level they got down to. Um, various bits of this have been recorded before, but it's never been recorded in its entirety in a sort of consistent way. So we'll be making drawings, photographs, records of everything and bringing all the historic information we've got together with a new record, making sure there are no gaps in between it. Um, so we're down at the sort of uh, very uh, eastern end of the area that we're, we've started on. Uh, in front of us here we've got the style of eight. Um, this is the foundation of a, a wall which runs the length of this room. Um, we've got various columns along that which have later had this uh, sort of screening inserted. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Peter Davenport at this point uh, to talk about the style of eight and talk, take, take us through a bit more of a tour of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we've got in this room, Peter. Yeah, well, I think you're right, Simon, that everything that we've done here has been to remove the Victorian crud, if you like, and the stuff that's built up since the Victorians were here, so you can actually see the archaeology. And looking at the style of rather oddly at first, we've got these great blocks of stone that's filling the spaces between the columns. And one of the things we've realised just in the last... Well, oh, actually, really today, discussing it, is that although we always knew that these stone blocks were secondary, they were inserted between the columns to, to, to convert what had been an open colonnade, an open portico, an open passageway into a, an enclosed passageway, obviously much more sensible than the British climate. Um, but how do they do that? How do you put big blocks of stone between columns? And this one on the right has got, it's got a slot in it, it's got a groove. Now if you have two columns either side of a slab of stone, you're not going to get the stone into those grooves without moving the columns. And they didn't do that. But we just realised that actually each column has a groove on one side and just a flat piece, a flat shape, on the other side. So what they obviously did was just pushed this big piece of stone into the groove and then swung it round against the flat face of the other um, column. So we've actually got actually begin, begin to understand, well, pick up an odd little problem we had, but also to understand how the Romans built the thing, in the, in the, how they altered it in, in the second phase of work. So that's, that's a nice little piece of, you know, small detail, but quite an important one about how to understand how the thing fitted together. C can um, you tell us, Peter, what actually, uh, how this arrangement here works? Because uh, I can see two small holes here, mm. and uh, there's a sort of ledge on this side. Yeah. So what, well, uh, what's going on there? Well, what you've got to... The first thing you need to understand is where you and I are standing. Yeah. We're, more, we're up a, a foot or 18 inches or more above where, where, the, where the else over there is. Yeah, and this would have been inside at this level, and okay. inside the building. Um, and at one point, when they put this block in, this was a window. It had a rebate for a frame, okay. and it had metal grills here for security. But then at some point in the late Roman or possibly even post-Roman period, yeah. we know that that level out there rose about 18 inches. People were dumping stuff, relaying floors, rearranging okay. things. Yeah. Yeah. And this, they took the window, and this became a door. 
Yeah. And that's why you've got that wear. Uh -huh. right. That's people just walking okay. through. Yeah. Did that first window that would have been there, would that have been real flat glass? No, it would have been, it may not have been glass at all. Yeah, okay. The Romans, shutters. The Romans did use window glass, and we do find Roman window glass in excavations in Bath. Yeah. But it's a very expensive thing to have. Mm. Um, and very often, even in Rome, you'll find buildings that still survive that instead of glass have very thin horn. Okay. In, yeah. Or even marble, cut mm. really thin and polished. Oh. So you can't see through it, but the light comes through. It's translucent. Mm. And, you, and they would be quite small panes fitted into lead or iron frames in there, slotted in there. And, and so if it was a... Uh, special and valuable material, mm. then it might have been recycled, which is why we haven't found it here. Well, that's right. I mean, and of course, the other sad thing about this site is because it was dug by the Victorians, yeah. it was dug in one archaeological memorable phrase like a killed potatoes. <laughs> nothing <laughs> was nothing was saved, nothing was recorded except the obvious things, the big yeah. pieces of stone, um, remains like this. And from from where we're standing up to way above our heads, we know that there was substantial archaeological deposit that could have told us all sorts of things yeah, about this site. A bit of that, just along here. Shall we there is, yeah, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we just come this way. <laughs> um, you can see here, in all of these sections, some of that surviving archaeological yeah. deposit. Oops. This is, yeah, I mean, this is both very valuable and very sad. <laughs> because, again, this shows us what the Victorians dug away, and as archaeologists we know just how valuable this could have been. Now, we can't excavate that because there's a building above it, and we don't have Victorian underpinning um, holding the road and the building up. Um, but we've studied these over the years in some detail, and we think what we're looking at, here's the side of again where the columns stood, running in, and behind there is where the walkway was. Um, and here, this is all deliberate infill behind here, all these stones. That's a paving surface. That's been put in by somebody probably in the early post-Roman years, 5th, 6th century, who knows. And then we've got a lot of rubble and dump, and we've got other... There's a layer there that actually shows us some... Probably a, where, where the, the dumping stopped, and there's kind of a thin, dark layer of trample, just like we've been clearing away from the area yeah. here. Mm -hmm. This is 20th century trample, this is perhaps 7th or 8th century trample. And then we've got more dump, which we don't really understand, more material, more layers going up to the surface, towards the surface. Um, you can imagine as archaeologists being uh, wanting to dig that. Yes, yeah. That would be really, yeah. really wonderful. But we can't, so we just have to do the best we can. We're just lucky we've got what we've got. <laughs> yeah, archaeology for providing professional lead and direction to the project. And we've also got lots of local people from the Bath and Camerton Archaeological Society. And here's Henry, <laughs> who uh, is uh, uh, from the Bath and Cam. Yeah. And uh, you've been involved in organising the group of local people who have been taking part in this excavation. Absolutely. We've got uh, quite a number of members who live in this area. And uh, obviously uh, the opportunity to work with the Roman bars and with professional archaeologists has been a fantastic experience. Um, uh, all of them have, uh, have said to me how much they've enjoyed being on the site. I mean, actually working on um, the, the thing that they know and love because of the, the, its tourist appeal um, in the city that they, that they live in. And uh, they're, 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 they're amateurs, but they've a lot of experience. They've all got a lot of experience of, of buildings and, uh, and archaeology, and uh, they're able to assist the professionals um, in some of these tasks that need doing. And some of them are, are not, uh, um, they're, they're exact tasks and delicate tasks, and you need the experience to do it, but uh, they're physical tasks often. And, uh, and there's a very special skill which the Bath and Cam have brought to this project, uh, which is their experience of working with geophysics. Yes, we've got, uh, we've got quite a, uh, a, a group of um, um, experienced uh, people on geophysics as well as equipment that we can use. So when we began uh, this space here, we um, uh, used a, a couple of resistivity techniques, which is a, a technique where uh, electrical impulses are passed through the ground uh, to determine what is uh, what's beneath the surface that you can see, because 
um, because you, you don't necessarily want to start digging everything up if you can discover something, uh, something that you're trying to find out through other means, non-invasive techniques. And uh, so one technique in particular that we use uses a, a series of steel pegs which are driven usually into the ground. But on this occasion we managed to come up with a, a cunning way of poising them above the ground. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's too <laughs> cunning. Um, actually, I, I will because we use some plastic <laughs> beer glasses uh, as the mechanism to actually support the steel pegs. But they work very well because uh, um, we were able to get good readings uh, throughout the space in what's a very tricky space to do this kind of work. And just to, just to touch on that subject, we, what we're looking for under these surfaces is signs of drains that we know are buried underneath here. We don't know exactly where they go in finding those. We haven't seen the preliminary. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, our, our, he our uh, head of the geophys section, John Oswin, who's got considerable expertise mm -hmm. in uh, analysing uh, both, both the field work and analysing uh, work, um, is extremely pleased with the results that we got, uh, considering the difficulty of the surfaces that uh, one's working with. Hopefully we'll find, we know there's a drain a metre and a half beneath where we're standing roughly, somewhere <laughs> under here. Hopefully we'll be able to find out where that is. Yes, the, uh, in terms of the overall layout of the baths, that uh, drain that we're looking for, uh, we think, uh, represents on the south side almost the equivalent of uh, an enormous drain that people who visited the baths in the past uh, may have seen, uh, in which hot water flows from the spring runs through the museum and then heads off through a large culvert down to the river. Mm. We think there may be a similar culvert on this side, mm. possibly a bit smaller, but nevertheless uh, part of that original grand scheme for the baths mm. when it was first conceived <coughs> in the first century AD. So uh, let's just go along here and uh, have a look at some other things that have been coming up. Uh, we just need to uh, uh, carefully cross this wall. Thinking of drains, if we look down here, uh, you can see uh, the brushes and shovels where people have been cleaning out here. Uh, you can also see some capstones running across at an angle here. And uh, uh, could you tell me, Peter, what you think uh, the purpose of this is? Well, well, we talked about the big drain running along the length of this space. Um, and this <coughs> runs into it, and it run runs into it from the Roman plunge bath that we know is just over there. Um, that was dug out in the 19th century by the Victorians, by Major Davis, city architect. Um, he then backfilled it and just mentioned that he'd found it. Um, back in the 60s, Professor Barry Cunliffe actually excavated a tiny corner um, and picked up the end of this drain in the side of the bath. Then it was backfilled again. In fact, there was some building work that covered it up. And then recently, we re-excavated a bit more of both his fill and the Victorian fill, and we confirmed, yes, that is the, the bath that it's there. Um, it's about, what, 12 feet square or something like that, um, and uh, about three or four feet deep. Um, and it had, um, uh, we know that it had, from the old, the old descriptions, um, rendered steps, concrete covered steps, waterproof render over the steps that went down into the bath. And we're just beginning to uncover the top of them coming out into this room behind us, which was the room which, in which this, this bath was the, in the end of. Um, and uh, that is, the, is, is that, that those steps and, and the, the waterproof cement are then form the whole floor across there, which we've done only, only just recently now uncovered, really got it clear, but, but it's there. Um, and, um, and it runs up the wall and it runs up this wall, which is the other side of the room. Um, so we're just speculating really on how these were used, whether we've got yeah. a, whether that's a hot bath, mm. and then we've got a room that you come into mm. in here, mm. perhaps for treatments, or is it mm. just a passageway through to the cold bath? Mm. Because from so this, this large room, work we know you get into it from the corner, from the opposite circular bath, and there's a door right here where we're standing, so I fall into it. Um, this door's rather fun because it actually has the door pivot in the threshold where the Big Roman doors in baths didn't have hinges like we have, like we think of, but they had a peg on the top and bottom of the door, and it was slotted into that, and of course the lintel up here was slotted over the top of it. 
and the door then just swung no, in the pivot. Coming out at like that. And it'd be coming out this way, closed. closed, yeah, op opening out to where Stephen is and coming yeah. around like okay. that. Okay, right. So that was like the inside, and this was, well, the outside. This is a puzzle. We're still not quite sure what's going on here. We're yeah. still investigating. We've got the end of the style bait over there, and then we've got a doorway into a bar complex here. So we've got a colonnade there, bar and a room, ante room for it here. What was this space? Yeah. We know it was walled off later. The wall over here is later than this one. It's quite late. It seems to belong to a period when the floor was raised up quite a way out here. Out here. Um, again, it could have been late Roman, it could have even been post-Roman. The very end of Roman times, we're still struggling with understanding. We don't really know how this place came to an end. Because the Victorians dug all that information away. You know. <laughs> um, and um, so that, that, but any little hint we can get of what was going on in that late period is really quite informative and really interesting. Uh, over here, you mentioned the floor, and uh, you know, the fact that it's the first time you've ever really seen it like this. That's the same for me. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's amazing you can get excited over something uh, like a mortar floor. Mm. Uh, but it is covering an enormous expanse. Mm. And I think one thing we have to remember, really, about this space here that we're standing in is we are in central Bath, and there are very few opportunities anywhere in central Bath to open up significant areas for archaeological investigation. Very often, these excavations take place uh, in small uh, keyhole uh, investigations, uh, in the cellars of houses or businesses, and it's very difficult to get uh, a proper overview of what's happening. Um, and, of course, they're often very uh, chopped about by later interventions, later uh, things that are happening. So that where Peter's standing now, uh, he's actually standing in a trench that was uh, excavated out today, uh, which uh, had uh, some 19th century pipes in it, late 19th century pipes, uh, later replaced in the 20th century. What it's doing, it's providing a section through all these archaeological deposits so that we'll be able to look at the side sections and form a, a clearer understanding and view of the sequence of buildings that uh, occurred in this part of the site. I think keyhole is the right word, Stephen. This is what, what we're doing here is very much keyhole surgery and taking out all of these modern drains, modern intrusions that have gone through the archaeology to get these sections, these windows through yeah. into the earlier period and try to, it, to, try to it, understand it, what's yeah. going on. And if it wasn't for these disturbances, which in themselves are quite horrible, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to look into the archaeology yeah. that we've got. It would just sit there and stare at us beautifully and well-preserved yeah. and uh, not terribly informative. But this, We may even get a chance here at some point to actually find that big drain which could run through this area. Um, and, uh, yeah, the drain runs roughly where, roughly where you're standing, we yeah. think. And um, what's interesting is the floor and the rubble makeup for that floor clearly go right across that area and continue yeah. across. Yeah. So, the so drain if the drain is under there, it's yeah. a very early stage in the construction, which is something we're trying to understand at the moment. Is Was it the first thing that went in? Was it, it would be the obvious thing to do, I think, but... Uh, can we confirm that? Can we find the construction trench for that early drain under this modern drain? That's if we can find it, then one thing would, would be uh, a really brilliant thing to be able to do uh, would be to uh, put in uh, a viewing um, uh, aperture mm. uh, so that when all of this space mm. is converted to a learning zone where uh, uh, thousands of young people will be coming every year, they'll actually be able to look down into it and see the water flowing through that drain uh, down below. Yeah. Um, because we know there's a drain over there, yeah. which comes from an early, an early bath. Yeah. So it could be looking to it just it, somehow it has to find its, its way into exactly. into this drainage system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, perhaps um, if we're quick, we could perhaps run round the uh, the other side of the site and. Uh, have a quick look at what's on the other side of this wall because the archaeological site just keeps going. <laughs> and uh, so just bear with us whilst we uh, hot leg it around to the other side of uh, that construction. We'll be going through a series of tunnels and passages.
So uh, I, have, I hope we haven't lost a signal in uh, coming around there, and uh, that uh, this new space isn't too echoey for people really to see whether it was possible, whether it was really possible to keep it open and display it. And we decided that really we couldn't because we could only get two sides or two and a bit sides of it, and this side to expose it would have meant removing later Roman archaeology because this is one of the very first things that were built in the past in the 70s or 80s AD. It was then filled in in the second century. This court, court was laid out. And then that other bath we saw with, with the modern drain coming away from it was built to replace it. And the small various walls that were here and the small rooms that were here that were associated with this bath were all taken away and the whole thing extended. Um, it's very hard to make sense of that now because Roman here, Roman there, if you look over that side, we're looking at late 19th century, early 20th century supports to the road above and the buildings above, um, which were put in um, when this area was, after this area was cleared, um, so the road could be kept in use up above. And again, like the other area, this was just left. Um, never, it was investigated from time to time, cleaned from time to time, but um, now the, 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 um, we're really hoping to actually get it clean, keep it clean, keep it available, protect it, um, use it as part of the public access, which would really be great. Yeah, this, this part of the site is destined to become fully publicly accessible. Uh, where that doorway is there is where uh, visitors to the bars will enter uh, this area. Uh, they'll be able to uh, walk around all of this space. There will be interpretation explaining its use uh, as an exercise court. Uh, but uh, the archaeology is going to be carrying on now for the next month or so. And uh, uh, every day throughout the calendar month of February, there are going to be tours taking place uh, 10 past the hour and 10 past the a half hour every day until the end of February. So if you'd like to come along and uh, explore these spaces, do come. And uh, uh, if you are local and have a discovery card, you will, of course, be free. Um, so uh, we hope you'll come along to see what's happening and uh, we hope you've enjoyed our contribution here today uh, from Henry, uh, Peter and Simon.